And, and this is what I really want to get uh, stuck into today. So uh, I, I'm not going to go into deep uh, introductions of all our speakers because they're all uh, very well, uh, very well uh, uh, explained in the program. But I'm now going to call on our first speaker, Dr. Ng, to, to start. You've got five minutes. I've got to be very strict. Uh, you know, the ladies down here are making sure I'm uh, keeping uh, the time go. So over to you, Dr. Ng. Thank you. Thank you, Nordin. And thank you to WIEF for the opportunity to share with everyone here about uh, energy transition, uh, hopefully to, to its net zero. Uh, I'm Ng Xin Wei. I'm uh, with Penang Green Council. Uh, for, for those of you who are not really familiar with Penang Green Council, we are a state agency set up in 2011. Our mission uh, is to nurture and support environmental causes in Penang. So what we have been doing the last few years, in particularly to my work, is to really work at the state level to support uh, national policy and targets, including uh, the targets on energy. So I, I guess, uh, being someone from, from Malaysia, I'll just give a broad overview of what the net zero transition is looking like in, in, in Malaysia. Uh, overall, Malaysia has uh, committed to cut uh, carbon intensity by 45% by 2030. Uh, that's a promise that we made to the international community. And we also promised to phase out coal and to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. And regarding renewable energy targets, last year the government uh, bumped up the targets uh, so that by 2025, which is in three years' time, we, we aim to achieve uh, renewable energy, uh, uh, the, the proportion of renewable energy in, in stock capacity uh, to be 31%, and which will go up to 40% by 2035. And uh, last week, uh, the national government introduced a national energy policy where in, inside the, the documents, they, 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 pro they uh, produced or they proclaimed that the aim to achieve uh, to have renewable energy 17% of uh, total uh, primary energy uh, supply by 2040. At the moment, it's about 4%. So, Four? Yes. Okay. Uh, from the latest uh, data that I've seen, uh, it's going to go up to 17% by 2040. That's uh, total uh, primary energy su uh, supply. And uh, uh, to support these, we have a series of uh, policy measures like uh, net energy metering, we have a uh, feed-in tariff, we have large-scale solar support system, and we, we also have uh, green financing support like uh, tax allowances, tax, tax exemptions, and green tax financing, uh, etc. And in the national energy policy that was introduced last year, uh, last week, there was also a target on uh, uh, energy, uh, electric vehicles, which is to be 38% uh, by 2040. Uh, unfortunately, I don't really have the exact data of what's the percentage right now, but I can tell it's pretty low. Uh, it's very low. So that's the overview of our national ambition on the zero, net zero transition. And uh, from, from the perspective of uh, Penang Green Council, we follow these targets, we follow this policy because we want to see what role can state government plays in helping to achieve these targets. They, obviously, there are certain obstacles and problems uh, that, from our point of view, apart from the, the usual ones that everyone has been talking about, whether it is financing, whether it is, uh, uh, you know, how to motivate people to take up the, you know, to, to use the renewable energy, uh, to install renewable energy. I think from our point of view, it's, uh, there is a huge disconnect between national policy and state, uh, implementation on the ground at the state level and local government. Uh, the national, national policies are usually implemented and driven by national uh, agencies, which uh, not, in most cases do not have a presence at the, state, uh, at the local level. So that sort of pushing it down through nat uh, national agencies could be a problem, uh, especially if there's no commitment from the state level or local council level. And there's also, we see a, a, an, an opportunity and obstacle as well in relation to electricity market reform. 
because at the state level, there's very little we can do, right? We can't, we can't, we don't have uh, millions of, of ringgit to, to give to people to, to install the, the renewable energy. So we rely a lot on national schemes, like uh, net energy metering. But we also hope that the electricity market reform can be carried out soon so that they will allow third party access, uh, open up the retail market, then it will give more space to, for local governments to, to introduce some policy to, to sort of accelerate the adoption. So final, one final point, I guess, to, just to mention that um, we also need to look at the whole thing from the just transition perspective, because at the moment, a, a lot of this, you know, renewable energy adoption, electric vehicle adoption, they are pretty much affordable, but only by a, a small group of uh, people. So we hope that the whole net zero transition will be broadened up to include more like uh, poorer households. Thank you. So, <clears throat> so we've got challenge. We've got the strategy in place. We've got some policies there, but we still need to drive it down to the ground. Now, now, Gauri, I want to ask you, looking at Penang, looking at uh, looking at the global uh, perspective. Where, where are we on this spectrum of development and, and what can we expect from the renewable, of course you're the International Renewable Energy Agency, what can we expect from you guys? Thanks, Nordin, and uh, great to be on this really good panel with experienced uh, panelists. Um, I, I want to actually take uh, the audience into what are we seeing at the global level. And clearly, what we are seeing is a complete transformation of the energy system as we know it today. So we are not looking at tinkering at the margins, but really redefining the way the energy systems of the future will look like. Uh, now, the good thing is that when we are talking about energy systems of the future, all the technologies that we require are already in place. So it's not as if we are waiting for some uh, you know, some magic bullet to happen in some time in the future that will help us move into the transition. There will be developments in technologies, make them more efficient, but primarily I think the technologies that we need are there today. Now, if you're looking at what are the six pathways which will define how we want to move into, the, into 2050, which is really the net zero, uh, there's a there's a lot of political commitment that has been made by leaders of the economies. But those commitments now need to be, you know, focused on strategies and uh, also, as uh, was pointed out, pushing it down to where the implementation happens. Um, uh, you know, so we are looking at a much more electrified world. We are looking at uh, something like 21% electrification right now, moving up to about uh, beyond 50%. Uh, we are looking at this electrification really being derived from renewable energy sources. Energy efficiency is going to be a very important factor, and so is the new emerging hydrogen economy. So uh, if I talk at the ASEAN level, you know, ASEAN is, is, is a very important part of the, of the global economy, and how the ASEAN transforms itself is going to be very, very, very critical. Uh, what we are looking is, uh, just to give you some figures, uh, we expect that by 2030, we are looking at something like 240 gigawatts of solar PV capacity being added here. Uh, you know, right now, the, the way the ASEAN uh, energy mix looks like, we have about 20% renewables, which is mostly coming from hydropower. Um, just about 3% coming from solar and wind, as probably also depicted in the case of uh, Malaysia, where it's a very small percentage. Now, this needs to grow. And if this needs to grow, naturally, the grids need to be strengthened. Um, you know, the, the other interesting facet of uh, ASEAN is that there's already a lot of uh, international cooperation that's happening between countries. So if Singapore is sitting at a geography that cannot produce much more because of land constraints, it has neighbors like Malaysia, Laos, uh, Indonesia that can actually produce energy, uh, green energy that can feed the data centers sitting in Singapore that are now demanding as a, as a result of their global mandate to go green. 
So, you know, these are the interconnections and the interdependability that can happen in this region. And for that, uh, IRENA, uh, which is, um, I mean, I should have started with what IRENA is. So, we are an international organization, an intergovernmental organization, which has 170 members with a mandate to support uh, members for more uh, renewable energy. What we've found in our analysis is that you need about 200 gigawatts of interconnected grids in this region to be able to take in the intermittent power that will come to support greening and the energy transition of this region. Just a short note on Malaysia. I think sitting in Penang and you know listening to the opening remarks of the speakers here is extremely encouraging because you know, we, we are sitting in a place that has been probably the oldest free port and has a huge manufacturing base. Can Penang actually transform itself into a regional hub of green manufacturing? Because the green industrialization that can actually be a huge opportunity for the ASEAN region can actually get powered by these hubs like Penang, which which can derive their, uh, you know, renewable energy from hydropower, which is still going to be a mainstay in Malaysia, but also solar coming from the peninsular Malaysia. So let me stop here, and maybe we can talk about the energy food nexus mm -hmm. in the next round. I, I want to talk about the energy food nexus. I want to talk about the cold chain. I want to talk about how that relates also to mobility. And that's where, uh, Professor Katsusan, I'm going to ask you to uh, take, take the, uh, the rostrum. Uh, you've got five minutes. I believe you, you're going to give us a, a bit of insight. So over to you, sir. Okay. Thank you very much for your uh, interesting and quite interesting discussion previously. So I'm talking about a little bit of the, the some people talking about the the, the remission of the mobility. It's just only a battery electric vehicle. But that is not really true in this. So I'm just point what already decided and what the people recognize. Only a small part of the, uh, the passenger car can be suitable for the, uh, the battery group, but heavy duty or other part of the transport need uh, much more uh, huge energy. So. Actually, the people talking about the hydrogen economy or hydrogen, some people are very skeptical because of the efficiency. If you convert from the electricity to hydrogen, hydrogen back to the electricity, you have only 50% left. But this is a matter because of the hydrogen is actually the vector to use more renewable into the society. Actually, we are using energy not just for the uh, say, uh, oil, uh, because we have a lot of, uh, like, uh, say, uh, the industry use a huge energy, like a steel making. It still cannot be made by the electricity. You need some molecular. That's the hydrogen. So, and important is, uh, as I said, uh, there are no silver bullets. So, and also the, uh, we need to create a new idea to this region because of the, you have a lot of renewable, but not only just uh, solar or uh, uh, the hydro, you have a lot of bio and so, and so uh, uh, this is some of the priority of our customer who choose the vehicle. So for the customer, the fuel doesn't matter whether that is hydrogen or electricity or gasoline or diesel. People want the comfort of the vehicle and the convenience of the vehicle. So we need to provide the good mobility for the customer. And this should, shall be decarbonized in the future. So, and also the, so some people said uh, hydrogen is too expensive. It, it is true in, in the last year because of the oil was so cheap. But now the gas is very expensive as they said that uh, Actually, green hydrogen is cheaper than the blue hydrogen, the, which is coming from the uh, natural gas or the, so. And also that we recognize uh, oil and gas is fluctuating hugely. So, and also the, in 2050, we no longer release 
that is burning those kind of the uh, fossil fuel. So the good thing is uh, in the, after the COVID is that people recognize that uh, uh, climate change is very important, but uh, energy transforming is not just for the expense for the, uh, the, uh, the climate or uh, environment. So I wrote this in, uh, during the establishment of the Hydrogen Council that uh, energy transition will create a huge business like this, in this uh, 2.5 trillion dollars of the new business every year and 30 million of new jobs. So actually the, the energy transition and using more hydrogen will create more jobs and more opportunities. And good thing is currently we are the first time ever we can design our future because we have a target of zero carbon in 2050. That means every year we spend hundreds of trillions of dollars uh, to, uh, for the energy, so we can design our future. So, uh, I always talking to my students that you now have a, a big opportunity to design your future by yourself with the trillions of the budget. So, and also for this Malaysia or Islamic area, the relatively hot country, you need to create a new mobility system, which is not just for the battery electric or uh, transport. So I have there is a monorail I'm going to uh, build here. But how the people use the mobility after you already accustomed to the door-to-door -door capability of the vehicle. So this is what we need to create more idea to transform this world into the zero emission. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Katsusan. And I really like your, your quote here. The end of the Stone Age was not because of the lack of stone. You know? So I, I think we're actually in a very interesting uh, uh, scenario globally right now. We, yes, we still have plenty of stone, but we also have plenty of energy. But the question is, how do we get the funds into that energy? And, and for me, it's, it's investors, uh, whether they are public investors or private investors, are going to say, look, this is now an, an equitable and efficient way of investing. Now, Gauri, we were talking about last night, uh, you know, the, the, the tyranny of geography. You know, big countries have big problems. Is there a possibility that smaller to medium-sized countries can actually lead the way because their investment requirements are a lot less? And I'm going to then come to Penang and say, look, Penang, can you take the lead because you've got less space to worry about. Over to you, Gauri. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting that, you know, we're sitting in a region that uh, used to be defined by economic tigers. So these are countries in this region that have shown in the past the capability of actually emerging as very, very strong uh, economic uh, um, geographies. So there's really no reason why this new opportunity that Hiroshi San has just presented, or the opportunity of green manufacturing, or the opportunity of actually transforming the industrial sector in this area into a more green manufacturing segment, and the jobs that it will create, the more, uh, you know, the more skilled jobs that it will create. Now these are opportunities that need to be harnessed uh, but clearly, you know, um, policies and incentive structures have to, be, uh, have to be created in such a way that these opportunities can get converted into implementation frameworks. Because without having proper implementation framework, this will only remain intent, as you've just heard. Uh, it's also very critical that, um, you know, uh, you, you do need uh, economies that have the agility and the and the ability to actually take uh, decision making to a new um, you know to a new paradigm and creating that shift and I think this is a region that has that ability they've shown it in the past and there's no reason why it cannot become a region which actually gets defined by green manufacturing green jobs and green growth. Dr. Ng, can you define Penang's future 
is exactly what Gauri just said. Green manufacturing, green jobs, and green energy. We, we are trying to define it now. Uh, PGC and with some partners just launched a green industry circular economy program. We are working with uh, uh, large manufacturing uh, players here. The idea is to turn Penang into a green manufacturing hub. That's exactly our vision. But it won't be in five years' time, probably in uh, eight to ten years' time. But that's where we are heading. And energy, obviously, is, is part of the equation. Uh, for, for Penang, you, you would think that, you know, phys geographically we are small, probably it's easier to manage, but geography is actually to our disadvantage because uh, for Malaysia as a whole, solar has the most potential, apart from hydro. Uh, Penang doesn't have big reverse uh, hydro, it's not, you know, going to be a huge potential. For so solar and bioenergy. At the moment, uh, solar has the, the you know, the most, most renewable energy in Penang comes from solar, but we also have the disadvantage of not having enough land for large-scale solar. We have been looking into floating solars. A lot of companies have come to us, you know, pos pos possibility of floating solars, but it's, it's still relatively new, well-ish, so we haven't really uh, established any viable plans for, for that. So when it comes to renewable energy, we find that there is a huge limitation. If you can't do LSS, we have to do rooftop. And rooftop, not every roof can have solar, right? So even if we want to mandate people or buildings to have rooftop solar, we can't f physically do that. So that's why we are really, really looking towards uh, electricity market reform, where you don't really need to install solar to buy solar energy. Right? So at the moment, the, the market is pretty rigid. Uh, uh, you know, we have one, we have one TMB doing the, being the retail company. So, so we are looking forward to this sort of wider electricity market reform where they would give us more choices to move towards uh, renewable energy. But certainly, green manufacturing hub is, uh, is our vision. Do investors come to you and come to Penang and say, tell us your energy mix, or do they just say, tell us you've got energy? Tell us what your energy mix is, or tell us that you've got energy. Like I mentioned earlier to you, energy really, because we see it as something that TNB is doing. And TNB is, and, and TNB is the national, for the international people, TNB is the national uh, uh, producer and distributor of energy. Yeah, yeah. So at the state level, we are not used to thinking about our energy supply, because it's all sorted out. Uh, federal level, but with the renewable energy and distributed energy, there should be a space for us to play a more active role locally, right? To, to establish a, a, a more localized and distributed uh, energy. So when they come to us about an energy, energy mix, unfortunately, I think now it's less than two percent in terms of install capacity, not even like generation, right? So it's, it's very low, but at the same time, it has huge potential. Uh, in the, my RER report uh, uh, issued by uh, SEDA last year, it did uh, sort of list out in terms of rooftop energy, solar, how much like, potential we have in terms of floating. But those are just numbers, you know, not accompanied by any like, concrete sort of uh, uh, very localized policy. So we, are, we hope that we can you know, do, uh, look, at, look at it through other angles like buildings. Probably, maybe if we can set certain building standards, that might help. But at the same time, you know, we feel limited uh, because of the phys uh, our geography, our physical uh, size, and as well as the region electricity market. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Doctor. Now, Professor Katsu, I want to ask you, your area is, of course, around mobility. Now, for me, when I think about electrification of mobility, I think about Teslas being charged... Uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a wall somewhere. You know, in my mind, you stop your car, you plug it in. What can uh, countries do to achieve this uh, distribution of, of, of energy uh, mobility? And what is a, a successful model that we can start to look at? Is it about more Teslas, or should we start to look about... Uh, actually uh, movement of goods and services as opposed to movement of people. So should it be at trucks and trains as opposed to uh, people going to work and feeling that they're very environmentally friendly? 
just because they're in a, an electric car. What, what's, your, what's your idea? Yeah, that, that's a difficult question. <laughs> that's my job. That, your job is to answer uh, difficult questions, uh, Professor. Yeah, but, uh, I think that people's instinct want to move, cannot deny. So, and also, the, the, again, that once you are accustomed to the comfort of the current mobility, like cars, but actually, the, in this congested area, like I, I experienced last night and today, uh, the very congested area, so I would not like to drive the car here. Even I'm, uh, good, I'm, I like the driving in the countryside, basically. So this means this is a good chance to giving the, some good mobility, which can reduce the traffic and which is not di uh, different from the so-called public transport. The people don't want to crash into the big bus. So yesterday we moved in uh, six people in the one car. That reduced the seven cars from the, six cars from the traffic. So if you share the car quite well, and also the, if you give the comfort of the customer, so th this, is, this can be a little bit different from the people talking about just going to the electric because if you convert the car into the electric vehicle, the number of the car is not different from the current. That you still need to be in the sitting in the traffic jam. So and I realize that Penang is a very good area which has a very compact and good the, the road transport. If you reduce the traffic properly with the com combination of the road hybrid, so called I called hybrid, the public transport, which and also which you can give the door to door capability. So, uh, like yesterday, you drop me at the hotel and back to the hotel. So, uh, and if you are still comfort, you don't mind to spend five, five ten more I minutes. Mean, so, I think the you have a very good chance to, to in, in, uh, implement the new mobility here in Penang. And this will be also a good showcase for the rest of the world. So most of the public transport now talking about the, in Japan or Europe is uh, completely different because they invest huge money, tens of billions of money to, for Tokyo pub, uh, subway. And uh, climate is not but uh, not hot as here, so they can walk. But in the uh, middle of the Saudi or middle of the UAE, people cannot walk. <laughs> so I think that, again, that talking to your question, I think that Penang has a big chance to create a new mobility, which is different from the rest of the world. And also it can be a very good uh, say, uh, chance to initiate of the big part of the world. So I think that this is something, yes. So we've got to get the energy equation right, but we've also got to get the human equation right. Yeah. So the behavioral realities are, are, are going to be driving some of this energy transition. I, I want to open up to the floor now if there's any questions. I, I'm exactly one minute ahead of schedule in terms of uh, questions uh, from the floor. If you've got any questions, please, uh, now is a great time to, to start asking. Uh, I've got a whole set of questions here to get through as well, but if any questions, uh, you know, we want this to be a lively session. We've got these three experts here. Uh, now is the time to ask them very difficult questions. Okay, go ahead. Just let me know where you're from and, and then shoot your question. Hi, my name is Payfen. I'm from Flextronics. So I have a question with regard to um, policy, right? So being an investor in Penang, so I was listening to the panelists talking about, you know, some of the strategies and all that. So with the state government, right, how can we um, perhaps, you know, create some policies that would make it um, more, um, how do I say, it? for industries to maybe invest in green technology, like perhaps when we build a new building or when we are buying land, okay, to um, build a factory. So perhaps there could be, you know, incentives or there could be um, rebates, right, offered to companies that perhaps incorporate some of these green standards, uh, solar panels, um, natural lighting, you know, and I really like the idea of the new mobility. I mean, that's really something to think about, 
right? I mean, Penang is not very big. So if we could all have some of these um, interconnecting strategies from the state government, federal government, um, perhaps, you know, with the cooperation of um, private companies, we could actually create something interesting here. Okay, excellent question. I'm going to ask uh, Gaia, can you ask, answer that before I let Dr. Ng uh, put uh, the Penang government's uh, position out there? What is an international best practice in terms of attracting the right type of investors into this uh, green energy transition? Uh, thank you for this question because I think it's a very interesting trend that we are seeing internationally. Uh, in fact, uh, when I mentioned about Singapore and that the data centers in Singapore are now demanding from the government more green energy and Singapore not having enough rooftop space to be able to produce that solar energy means that you have to actually, you have a market that's uh, created by investors and from the demand coming from them. The issue is how do you open up the policy, and I think we can talk about it a little more, how do you open up the policy to allow these new manufacturing entities coming into Penang or any other manufacturing space to be able to buy green energy from the neighboring uh, state or in, in, the, in the context of Penang, how do you create that kind of a, uh, a framework that allows the green, uh, uh, the industries to actually source their green power from uh, the peninsula Malaysia, because as we know that Penang has a limited uh, place, but there is a market that's being created. Renewable energy, as we know, is now one of the cheapest sources of uh, uh, electricity. So it's a, it could be a win-win situation, both for uh, a relationship to get established between the investors asking for more green energy, the state creating the market with a, a relationship with the other states where energy could be drawn from and provided for uh, supporting green manufacturing and green growth in the region. Brilliant, thank you. Dr. Ng, what, what's your, your idea here? How are we going to get our investors this green energy? Or is it purely policy reform? Or is there something else that we can bring to the table? Is there an opportunity to get energy from... Uh, we're close to Thailand. How far away is getting energy from Thailand an option? Um, I would just answer what I can answer. The, I'm not really involved in the national energy strategy, you know, uh, headed by, by TNB and stuff like that when it comes to greed investment. And I think for manufacturing sector, for zero energy transition, uh, net zero transition for uh, for for me personally, it will be energy efficiency first, right? You you sort out you you cut down your energy consumption as much as you can before you think about renewable energy, right? The first step is energy efficiency, and from our discussion with a lot of large companies here, especially multinational companies, they don't need us to poke them internally. They already have the HQ coming down to them, say you need to do this, you need to do that. So we visited quite a few of the, the MNCs or the large local companies. They are doing very well on this. So they want to do more. So they say, okay, we want to do renewable energy. That's why um, in two, two years ago, uh, under the state government, we set up a renewable energy and energy efficiency task force, uh, specifically looking, looking into what we can do with buildings. Because like, like I mentioned before, energy sector is, is very much a national government main, uh, 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 area. So we look at p buildings and what we can do to, to, to mandate certain buildings to have certain amount of energy to be derived from renewable energy. And we, we obviously encountered a lot of restrictions because at that time, peer-to-peer uh, -peer purchase of renewable energy wasn't there. So we could only, okay, you, if you have new buildings, you, you put certain percentage of your rooftop has to be used for renewable energy. So we were discussing that. And then towards the end, uh, you know, they, they sort of established the renewable energy, renewable certificates. So companies now have the choice, instead of installing it on their rooftops, they can purchase the certificates. It's, it's almost the same. It's just that you don't have to do it. You just buy it from the market. That's why for us, we really hope that electricity market reform can continue to, to progress. That will give uh, investors here many, many more choices to source renewable energy. 
Regarding other parts of uh, transition, like whether it's water use, uh, waste management, I mean, the state government has uh, policies to, to encourage that. Uh, I think certain types of recognition or, or celebration of uh, uh, well-performing industries could, could be a possibility. Yeah, uh, until recently, the local government also gives rebates to uh, GBI certified, to Green Building Index certified uh, buildings in Penang. Uh, that unfortunately had, had stopped, but uh, I think it's, it's up for discussion what sort of incentives that we can give. Okay, excellent answer, excellent. I think we've got another question. Wait, you'll have uh, Orang Sarawak uh, at the back first, next. <laughs> Over to you, sir, with the hat okay. on, yes. Thank you so much. Uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Dr. Sri, Dr. Wee. I'm a fifth generation Penang descendant, and I'm bringing a couple of billion US dollar investment to Penang. The, the things I'm facing here is that I think we need a more concentrated effort in terms of EV. You see, I'm the master developer... In terms of, sorry? I couldn't hear that part. Which one? That, that we need a concerted effort in terms of? A, in, a concerted effort in terms of welcoming the EV mobility people from around the world. You see, I, I feel that I agree with Dr. Hiroshi. That's why I'm here today. But, but glad to see him. You see, Penang has got a unique advantage. We have the E&E &E industry here. We have everything here. That's why I'm the master developer for the R1 EV mobility, uh, what they call it, park that we're building. So what we're looking at is, I can see that the supply chains are here, but what we don't have is the right incentive. Yeah, so my question to the panels is, how can we work together with the state and everybody here to make it happen? We're all ready. We have everything from Silicon Valley and everywhere ready. Even my Chinese partners are willing to come here. But we don't seem to get the Rick Cupboard welcome. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. No problem, no problem. Uh, Professor Katsu, now we're talking about EVs. Now your key uh, experience is in the Prius, and it's a hybrid uh, uh, engine, a hybrid car. Are we, um, are we putting uh, electric vehicles, with, uh, with all due respect to the question, are we putting electric vehicles too, on too high of a pedestal? And should we say, look, we need to get to 50% hybrid, 10% EV, and then we'll move to that next phase? Or do we need to do uh, the great leap forward and, and say, look, jump over the whole lot and, and let's get to uh, EV and forget the hybrid? I think that uh, normal way, as you mentioned, that you set a certain target of the hybrid and the EV, and this is a very normal way. But I think that after I came to the Penang and walking around this, this may have some the frog jump from, from the traditional way because of the people are suffering from traffic jam, actually. So that if you convert from the EV, it doesn't solve the problem. Of the real problem is not emission. Emission is, of course, a global problem. So, so I think if you built the very good the transport, which is not a copy of the Tokyo or, uh, uh, so that, that may make the Penang very unique area. So only the cross is around 30, 40 kilometers and then uh, the people sitting close by. So I think the, uh, if you build and design the uh, city properly, uh, I think that uh, you can skip the, those kind of the uh, say expensive the, the, the experience we did in Tokyo. <laughs> so this is, I think that I feel the big chance for Pena to make the big, uh, make a big plan, and even for the the, the energy that he mentioned, that because of the hydrogen is a way to store the energy. Uh, so if you make a pipeline from Thailand to the Singapore, uh, then the first you can use for the natural gas, but if you later you can convert into the hydrogen, then you produce uh, hydrogen from Thailand with hydropower or somewhere in the solar, the, this can transport hydrogen and store the energy, huge amount by in the pipeline. That is being discussed in Europe also. So I think the big plan 
make the big change and also creating a new job and the new business here and also attracting those kind of the industry who want the carbon neutral the energy. And also the people are, I think the very important is uh, living happier and convenient here in Penang, I think. No, I love that mention that you, you have to be happier. And for me, if you want to start improving uh, the traffic, the first place you have to improve is the sidewalk. <laughs> you, you know, and, and that's the, the trick. And, and actually, I know this, the question is coming from two very renowned town planners. Uh, sir, over to you. Uh, thank you. Even though I know who you are, please introduce yourself, sir. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Nasruddin. I'm from Sarawak. Um, just a, a scientific uh, curiosity. Um, we have been hearing a lot about zero carbon, you know, net zero. Has there been any proper accounting done in terms of um, carbon balance? Um, at the global level or at the national level because you, if you want to go to net zero carbon, you have to know where you are, doesn't it? So is there, is there um, any work being done on, in, in, in that area? In that area, okay. Yeah, thank you. Brilliant. I'm going to start with, I'm not going to start with you because they are the obvious start. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ng, where are we in terms of carbon calculation here in, in, in Penang then? Professor Katsu, if you could tell us Japan, and then we'll get the global wrap-up from you. Uh, it's work in progress. That's what I can say. Uh, as far as uh, we know, I don't know about Sarawak, we haven't come across any state that has uh, continuous, uh, comprehensive uh, calculation of uh, carbon. Uh, so PGC has just started working on a, establishing a carbon framework for Penang. It's, it's not easy. It's, it's, we need a lot of technical uh, assistance, and technical assistance are expensive. Um, and calculation of carbon is not the number one thing on the list of government. So we, we have to make do. Uh, we have to give them time, give people time. We have to work with stakeholders to, to eventually make this, push it up the agenda a bit. But we are, we are working on it. We just got some funding uh, from the state government to, to do it. Uh, hopefully, we want it to be, be uh, done internally so we don't have to continuously rely on technical experts you know, from ECLAIR, from World Bank or whatever. We want to build internal capacity so that we can do and upgrade the, the system uh, every year or so. So you don't want to keep paying for expensive international no. consultants. <laughs> Sorry, guys out there who are here looking for those roles. We need them now. We need them now. Okay, need you do them need now them to now. To build our capacity. Yeah. Okay, excellent, excellent. Professor, over to you. What is the, the, the equation in terms of Japan? Yeah. Do you mean the calculation of the carbon? Yeah, yeah where, where is carbon? Uh, yeah, I think that, uh, oh, yeah, the, the, the putting the 1.6 gigaton of the carbon dioxide currently. So we are going to reduce one third by the impro uh, improvementing uh, better technology, and then we put uh, we use uh, renewable energy and hydrogen for reducing. But at the same time, that you mentioned that important is uh, in uh, we are working to calculate the carbon footprint. So uh, from your operation. So and also this is international. The collaboration. So uh, actually, the equation was calculated by the IPHG. Uh, so, but the implementation of the actual who authorized the figure, who authorized the so if I'm uh, say operating a company and how much carbon dioxide emitting from my operation need to be authorized somebody. So this is something also ongoing the international the organization, both from the government are working, talking together, but it may take decades. <laughs> okay, got it, got it. Thank you, Professor. Hey. Gauri, tell us, uh, scope one, scope two, scope three, where are we uh, in terms of the, the global reality in getting this calculated properly? So I, I just want to say that this is something that IPCC does on a regular basis. Yeah. 
And if I had to look, and I'm actually, I can only speak about the emissions that need to be reduced if you're going to be talking about a net zero energy transition, then globally this is a number of about 36.5 gigatons. And that then implies that we have to then take measures, whether it is making the world more electrified or uh, making energy efficiency as a major plank or bringing in more renewables into the electricity or getting in hydrogen, sustainable biomass. These are all measures that need to be taken to be able to reduce this, uh, um, this 36.5 gigatons, which is emitted because of uh, energy, um, because of the way we consume and produce and consume energy. Thank you very much, Gauri. Any, any other questions before I shift gears? Because I want to talk about disruptions now. Uh, Gauri, I want to go over to you again. Now, we, we see the, the, the Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict has, has really uh, changed the way we think about energy. Or maybe it's just uh, hasn't really changed the way we think about energy for those who think about energy, but now it's changed the way the general public thinks about energy. And, and, you know, European winters around the corner, we're talking about, you know, inflationary numbers, we're talking about global recessions. Is it all on the back of energy or is, is it uh, something else going on in terms of your thinking? Or is energy the baseline security that we have to get right before we get to the food security or, or, or those other kind of border security, you know, what, what is your thoughts? So, Nordin, <clears throat> I, I think, uh, you know, the crisis in Ukraine has pretty much pointed us out to uh, new terms being added to the, the energy discussion that has been going on globally. Um, you know, till, uh, till COVID, the main, uh, main reason why we wanted to make the shift into the new energy paradigm was climate change. Now the two other terms that have got introduced is energy security and energy in uh, independence. Uh, and sovereignty, yes. Uh, exactly. So these are very, very critical additions to the way we are thinking of energy now because countries, uh, you know, um, in, in the world that is dominated by fossil fuels, we know that there are certain geographies that have those resources and can harness them for the global good. But when we move into a more, uh, into a world that, uh, where energy will be powered by renewable energy resources, then this is a very different world because every country has some form or the other of uh, renewable energy available. The question really is of being able to harness it, upgrade your grids and your energy markets to be able to take that in. Now, what we are seeing happening in, in uh, Europe, to some it might look like, you know, we are moving back into coal, we are, you know, looking at nuclear again. Now, this, I, f I mean, we feel that this is a temporary kind of a, you know, a, uh, blip, so to say, in the larger uh, shift to more renewable energy, but also at the same time it has given the other countries and the economies a chance to think about how they want to look at their future with more energy security and energy independence being a part of the energy policy. Thank you, thank you very much. Professor Katsu, we've seen uh, conflict changes the way we think about supply chains. Uh, we saw, we see now the Ukraine, we see Russia, energy equation in Europe changed. Uh, a few years ago, uh, China and Japan had issues with the Chicago Islands uh, and the reality of rare earth supply now became an issue. Uh, and that then became an issue for mobility simply because all of that rare earth goes into, uh, especially, uh, you know, cars, trucks, planes, and, and trains. Japan then made the strategic decision to, to friendshore, to bring that production out of, of, of China and put it elsewhere in the world. Are we going to see more of that uh, in terms of the criticality of rare earths, especially in the area of mobility? I think that 
more you electrify the vehicle, you need some kind of those uh, material, especially for the uh, motor and so on. And also the, we recognize the importance of the, the uh, battery production because you need more the lithium and those kind of the, uh, not rare material, you have um, lithium everywhere in the sea, but very difficult to obtain. So I think that this the uh, way how we okay, create or to continue the value chain, uh, both of security and also the cost-wise, we are standing in a very, very difficult situation. So that's why I'm now a little bit about uh, skeptical about the total battery electric vehicle because of the lithium is getting more and more expensive. The car is, battery car supposed to be much cheaper now from the Bloomberg the new energy, but still very expensive because of those kind of things. So I think that uh, there will be some competition between those expensive car and cheap solution. So, and also the those synthetic fuel or those can is under discussion. So any good thing is uh, two years ago, I uh, made a report about hydrogen council it needs 100 billion dollars to reduce the cost of the hydrogen down to competitive with the fossil fuel. But because of the COVID, because of this energy security, 100 billion has been already decided to spend by the EU government. That means uh, it may took 10 years to reduce the cost. It may, the cost can be go down within the new, next few years. This is ongoing now. So, and then the, those hydrogen do not use a lot of those rare material. So uh, that, that makes the use of the battery uh, much less than people think to be. So this will be a quite interesting situation now. So anyway, the solar panel, 10 years ago, it was expensive. Now it's getting very cheap. This is ongoing for hydrogen's case because of this a new situation, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. We have, we have 30 seconds to close this off, uh, but we have one last question. Sorry, I'm going to be in trouble later. Uh, this gentleman is wearing a very nice suit, yes, so I can't afternoon. say Good afternoon. My name is uh, Nail Latipov. I'm ambassador of Russia here. And you see, I would like uh, just to make uh, two short notices uh, on your question. You have told that uh, Russia, uh, Ukraine, crisis is, became the uh, uh, cause of uh, energy crisis in, in Europe. And I would like to say that not the conflict, but this uh, energy crisis became uh, moreover be, be before our conflict. Is, uh, I, have to, uh, I would like to remind you that for a long time, Soviet Union and then Russia have a long-term contract for supplying uh, gas and oil to Europe countries. And who declined these things? Who refused from these long-term contracts? European countries, not Russia. The second thing is uh, that uh, not Russia refused to supply energy to Europe countries. Europe countries uh, impose sanctions and stop supplies uh, to the European countries. And it, what the result? Now all the European countries that they are uh, saying that they will meet next next uh, winter with energy crisis. And one more thing. In, uh, to, just before, we have only 20 seconds. Don't try to put the, all the blames to Russia and China. Please look at the policy of Western countries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for that. Uh, uh, I will take it as a, as a comment more than a question. Uh, and I think the, the discussion uh, needs to continue. Uh, around, uh, and, and the reason why I'm asking the question is to understand, one, the source of disruption and also the solution. Uh, so I, I think that's uh, one of the key areas uh, that we need to uh, understand from a business perspective. With that, I want to give the last word. To, uh, okay, we're going to give you one more. This is what happens when you left. One last one and then one last one. Very quickly, sir. I'm audible. Uh, thank you very much. Actually, the just now, the, His Excellency just talked about the Russia and uh, Ukraine matters. I would like to the, touch to this one moment, sir. Since long time, uh, 
the Rohingya issues is a, one of the main issues in our Southeast Asia. Sorry, sir, can you just introduce yourself and where you're from? Oh, I'm uh, from Bangladesh. I'm the director of Bangladesh Malaysia Chamber of Commerce and Industry. So, transforming for future, like so that in uh, our Southeast Asia, there is a long issues as Rohingya issues. So, that's, that is becoming one the issues for the, our the economical side and other things. So, Bangladesh is supporting to the Rohingyas. Malaysia also supporting to the Rohingyas. But we are is uh, all the times is uh, facing these problems and how this transforming for futures, this economies matters. So how that means that we can coordinate because always is coming the, just recently this uh, Russia and uh, the Ukraine matters. So the world is effective. So in our Southeast Asia also effective because of the Rohingyas matters. So kindly make a one comments about this matter to us. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. We'll also take that as a comment. And, and really, as the last comment, I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Ng for, for the last word on this panel. Uh, explain to us in, in 30 seconds or more, uh, what does the future of Penang look like in your vision 20, 30, 50 years from now as we get through this energy transition? When it comes to energy transition, obviously, it relies heavily on what the national government is doing. So we hope that they proceed with the transition, uh, sort out things that they need to sort out, and also we have to deal with legacy issues of our oil and gas uh, sectors, uh, but I don't think there's a huge problem of trans uh, trans transitioning. So Penang's fate really relies a lot on what, what's happening at the national government. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, and with that, I'm going to pass it over and, and thank our, our panel members, everybody, uh, for an excellent and lively discussion, which is always good. Uh, and now over to you. Uh